<laughs> right, as, um, as, as uh, uh, Donna uh, introduced, well, I, yeah, so most of my work is, uh, is in economics, and my specialization, my area of uh, concentration is international economic and international investment. So that's, uh, that's why I bring up this kind of uh, topic for, for, uh, for my talk today. Okay. Um, well, uh, if, um, I'm not sure, maybe some of you probably know, uh, Cambodia was, uh, you know, there was a long history of uh, regime changes. So we were under the uh, colonization of France for about 90 years. After that, we come to another regime, you know, and then go to war, and then Khmer Rouge regime, which killed. Uh, when I was student, I was told that uh, around three million, more than three million Cambodian were killed. But then after that, uh, they say about 1.7 million Cambodian were killed during that time. That is the official statistic. And those who, who were responsible for uh, the genocidal uh, thing uh, have now been brought to justice right now. Okay, and, and the establishment of the court okay, on that. Right, so the structure of my presentation is gonna be uh, economic transformation, just a, a kind of, you know, a brief of economic history of Cambodia, how we come to today level. So that, uh, that's the things that uh, is in my talk. And the second one is about foreign direct investment. We, uh, after the election, we receive also investment uh, from other countries as well. And then we come to technology transfer, we learn something from, uh, from uh, foreign countries as well. And then I talk about international trade. I think this involves, uh, I think uh, this is of interest to many people. I think also a hot, a hot issue here in the United States as well, okay? So I'll talk about that. It could be uh, the implication for your country as well when <laughs> you know there's a kind of protectionism uh, against international trade. And then uh, I will present about Cambodia pre uh, uh, present and the future of Cambodia as well, okay? That, uh, that a very short thing, okay? Um, right, um, uh, here this is uh, the thing that uh, from Pol Pot regime. So uh, as I said, uh, they kill, I was told about more than three, uh, three million uh, Cambodians were killed during that time, but official statistics say 1.7 million Cambodians uh, were killed, okay? So we are still, uh, some people are still under dram uh, dramatized. Uh, of that regime. And this is uh, on, the, uh, on the Liberation Day, which is on the 7th uh, January 1997. Okay, so you see, this is Phnom Penh City. It's like it was a ghost city. So no one there. Okay, and people were scared of moving back to the city. They just, they just wanted to go to the countryside because they, they didn't know, you know, what, what would happen after this. So even, even our family tried to hide in the jungle, you know, I was so small during that time. So, but I knew a lot of things as well <laughs> during that time. Uh, this after the Pol Pot regime, okay, after Pol Pot regime from uh, in the early 1980s. So we, uh, this is the uh, uh, rice planting season in Cambodia, so we use very traditional method of, of planting, okay? So this is, uh, this is the situation. I could be some, during that time, I probably that small boy. So working the same thing. So working day, uh, during the daytime, so I work, and after school, then I just go directly to, I went directly to, to the rice field, helping my parents on that, okay? And there were no school in my, uh, my, my uh, uh, com community, so, and then I have to walk long distance to, uh, you know, to get schooling uh, in other, other village as well. So, and with barefoot, we were so poor, no shoe, and I, I have a short, and I have only a pair of, of dress only. So during during the, the the rainy day, I was so worried. You know why? Because I was so worried about how could I get my clothes dry. <laughs> that that the thing happened. Uh, to us during that time. Okay, um, uh, after the, the Khmer Rouge uh, regime uh, until uh, 1984, 
uh, we were doing collective farming. So we, we, were, we didn't own any land. So we just uh, grew rice together and then they just, we get a share of all the rice. I was small, I remember I get just half of the, of the, the adult share. <laughs> so they, they, they get that. So, um, and then uh, after this, starting from 1985, uh, okay, to around 1998, uh, this is what we call rehabilitation phase, okay? That rehabilitation period. And, um, and then we start to, you know, we have Cambodia economy was uh, completely planned economy after the Pol Pot regime. So during that period, especially after the election in 1993, we, I just want to emphasize that <coughs> our first ever national election took place in 1993 with the help of uh, United Nations. And we, we held the first election uh, during that time <coughs> with the result of two co-prime minister two prime minister, so one what we call co-prime minister, okay, the first and the second prime minister. And the first was, was uh, Nororam Ranarat, and the second prime minister uh, during that time is the current prime minister of Cambodia today, so, uh, yeah. And, and we not, uh, you know, before the election, we, we were not, uh, uh, we were also uh, under economic embargo uh, from other countries as well. See, we, we were isolated under isolation, under economic embargo. Actually, we want to open, but they just closed our door. And we can't do anything. We couldn't do anything, OK? So that's what we suffer. So after election, the election foreign direct investment start to come in. A lot of investment opportunity there, you know. And also international trade also uh, start to go up. Uh, foreign, uh, what we call official development assistance from other country they also uh, flew in as well during that time, and that helped to develop the, you know, <laughs> the, the country that were uh, completely destroyed uh, by the Khmer Rouge regime. So, and, and during that time, we were no school, we were deprived of education. There were no education during that time. So, uh, and, and that's why after that period, Cambodia was so hungry for education, right, including myself. Um, I compute the growth rate uh, on, on per annum uh, over almost 10 years uh, after the, uh, you know, during that period, okay, uh, sorry, between uh, 1990 and 1998, and that the only official data that we have and more reliable data, and before that, uh, data were not recorded, okay, so then I could not find it, and most of the time it was not so reliable. Data. That's why I use that one. It's more reliable. So we we had a growth rate of about well about almost five percent uh, uh, per year. Okay, even but of course we start from a very small one. You know, it's a like small cake. So even it grow five percent is it's almost nothing, right? Okay. Um, uh, then on on the phase two, I call reconstruction. That is uh, that is also uh, I think it's also known to the Cambodian economies as well. So even after the election, we still were in conflict, civil war, still, okay? So and then uh, we enjoy the full uh, peace, security, stability, only in late 1998, very recently, or early, to, uh, early, in nine, uh, early 1999. Okay, that we enjoy full pace. You can travel anywhere in Cambodia at night, okay? You can get a drink uh, on the river, <laughs> yeah, on the river bank until midnight. Uh, you would not have any uh, problem, okay, in terms of security, in terms of uh, fighting. And we also have, of course, political stability after, after the election, especially um, after 1998. Uh, 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 90, Okay, and we uh, were admitted into ASEAN. Okay, so <coughs> ASEAN is like ASEAN is like something like NAFTA in the United States. Okay, this is the free trade area. So in the United States, you have NAFTA. Okay, North American Free Trade Agreement uh, between 
uh, the United States, uh, Mexico, and Canada. And we have 10 countries in ASEAN member states, so we can, and goods and services uh, is flow, you know, uh, freely uh, among these countries. I say freely, but of course, uh, <laughs> in theory we call it freely, but there's always administrative barrier uh, among countries as well, okay? So we, we are not living in a free world, of course. That's what I told students as well, <laughs> okay, right? Um, and we enjoy growth rate even, even higher. So from uh, 1999 to 2003, we got more than 8% of uh, the growth rate, okay? Right. Uh, and then phase uh, three, we call take off phase, okay? So we call take off uh, period. So then we also admitted to WTO in 2004. And I was told that uh, Cambodia was the only poor country in WTO on that year, okay, in 2004, okay. And uh, during that period, okay, 2004 to uh, 2008, we enjoyed double digit growth rate. So growth rate some, uh, in 2005, it went up to a 13 point something percent. So growth rate is high. That of course, because, because we enjoy peace, stability, then, uh, you know, investor from other country, they can come, they invest, and we also engage with international trade, uh, with mostly with America and with European uh, uh, unions as well. Okay, we we you know we enjoy a, a kind of status of uh, low income country, and we got a kind of uh, preferential treatment uh, from the United States. So under what we call uh, most uh, most favored nation uh, status, and that we can uh, export to the United States. And that's the reason why some of the company from other country came to Cambodia to produce in Cambodia, export under Cambodian names as well, okay? Right, um, this is what I call uh, post-global crisis growth. That is uh, from 2010 to 2015. So we still uh, enjoy a growth uh, per annum of 7%. So I calculated over that period is about 7%. So you know that it, those of you who study macroeconomics, if a country enjoy a growth rate of about 7% 7, 7 per year, meaning that their income is double every 10 years, okay? So you use the rule of seven, uh, you know, 70, what we call the rule of 70, okay? 70 divided by the, the, the growth rate by seven, you get 10 years, then, uh, then the country can double their income every, every 10 years, okay, right? Um, so this is, if I use the, the growth over the period from 1990 up to 2006, and 2008, this is just a focus by, by the World Bank and Asian Environment Bank is still maintain uh, 7%. So, so you see the growth rate is on every, we are on the, the uh, positive trend, on the upward trend, but we were very affected uh, by, the, uh, by the global crisis uh, in 2009 that of course, uh, Cambodian economy, uh, you search on Cambodian economy, uh, the driver of the, of, the, of the country economy, only four main drivers. So one is tourism, of course, because of the Goa temple, and you saw from the picture. And another one is garment industry and footwear, okay? So that one, and, and you go to the mall here in New Hampshire, you can always find probably Cambodian, uh, close producing Cambodians as well. And another one is real estate because of the, you know, we are at the development stage, then uh, uh, construction is, is booming, okay? And, and the third one is, of course, agriculture, okay? And that, uh, pushed by that. And uh, to me, you know, when, when there is the external shock, then three sectors, three drivers already affected, mostly the construction, when you're, you feel poor, you don't want to build new house, right? Tourism, when you feel poor, you don't want to go elsewhere. You stay home, right? Okay, buying clothes when you're poor, you just delay purchasing your clothes. Then that's the reason why we got severely affected by the global crisis uh, in that year. But and then we, our economy recovered quickly after, after that year, okay? This is uh, the story. I put it in the graph so that it's easy to, uh, to see that. Okay, uh, we also, Cambodian economy also, 
uh, suffer, uh, you know, experience, I say experience not suffer, but experience from what we call structural change in the economy. Structural change means the change between sector, okay? Some sector going down, some sector going up. So if you look at this graph, uh, the, the blue one is industry, and the green one, uh, the green one is the service, and the, the, the uh, yellow one is uh, the agriculture. So agriculture share of the GDP going down over the period. This does not mean we produce less rice. We produce more rice, but just the case that other sector also increase much faster, okay? That's the reason why uh, we have the share of agriculture is going down. And well, of course, some of the land for agriculture are already converted into factory, you know? So if you, if you have chance to visit Cambodia, on the road from Phnom Penh city to Sihanoukville to the coastal area, and then you see along the way you see factories so on, on both sides of, of, uh, of the main road to Sihanoukville as well, okay? Right, so we see that, and uh, industry mostly, uh, the share that most, most of the share taken by the uh, uh, garment and footwear industry in, in the country, okay? So uh, that is the thing that I got from uh, Asian Development Bank, and probably you know we have Asian Development Bank is working something very similar to uh, the World Bank as, as well, but concentrated in, in Asia, and we also have African Development Bank as well, right? working in Africa, okay. Right, um, after the election, uh, in particular, in 1994, uh, um, uh, the Cambodian government set up, uh, you know, established um, an institution which is responsible for uh, foreign direct investment, what we call CDC, Cambodian uh, Council for the Development of Cambodia. And they take charge of, you know, uh, the investment project, both domestic and, and foreign. Okay, so then the law was established in 1994, so we open very widely. So foreigner can own up to 100% of the investment project. So we didn't impose any uh, what we call equity uh, share participation like other countries. So we just open up very widely. So they can either uh, have partner with Cambodian uh, 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 company or they can go on their own. But through my observation, through my research on that one, I collect the data on that one, uh, when we just open up, then mostly, you know, in order to share risk, they just partner with Cambodian uh, company first. So after a few years, they just go on their own. They just uh, set up a project by themselves. So they don't, they don't have uh, uh, their partner with the Cambodia anymore. Okay, so that is the thing. So um, the law was, was uh, revised in 2003 in order to make it even, uh, you know, favorable for the investment from other countries. So, uh, so under the law, uh, the 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 approval for an investment project uh, takes right now about 28 working days, and now even the government say, well, you have to finish within this number of days. Okay, then they have to work hard uh, to get the investment approval uh, during this uh, uh, eight, uh, 28 working day. And the corporate tax is about 20%. So if you compare to other country, to our neighbor, we are still below uh, other neighbors as well, okay? And a tax holiday is up to nine years, okay? So you also enjoy, this is how, I think this is, I think two generous uh, fiscal uh, incentive for, for the <laughs> foreign investor, okay? So of course, when, when you give something to them, they just get it, they just wanna get it, okay? Right. Um, uh, for the investment project, I think most, most of the projects are export oriented, meaning that they produce just for export to other countries, as I said earlier. So if you import something in order to, to, to finish the product in Cambodia, you don't have to pay tax, tax free. You can import all raw material, intermediate input, into the country uh, without uh, paying tax for that one. So this is the mode, I think that one of the, mo the, the strongest uh, motivation for the investor to come. So they ship something from their own country, put in Cambodia, enjoy low Cambodian labor force, you know, 
uh, low weight, low weight, uh, low weight uh, labor pool, and we have we have a lot of young people, men and women, who are you know uh, hunger for uh, for jobs. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay. Um, okay, and and also we also adopt a kind of uh, no discrimination. So when we give incentive, there's no discrimination. Uh, you know, between domestic and foreign companies. So we just treat them equally, okay? And also no nationalization. Nationalization means in international uh, uh, business term, meaning that the government will not uh, take your company, okay? So they guarantee for, for that one, okay? And as I said, no requirement for equity participation. So you can own up to 100% and uh, no foreign uh, exchange restriction as well. You can use dollar. So Cambodia is like another state of the United <laughs> States. So, <laughs> so you get you can pay in U.S. dollar even the haircut. Okay, wow. you, yeah, even the haircut you can pay in U.S. dollar, and in the countryside they accept U.S. dollar as well. Okay, so <laughs> right that because the dollar is this, the dollar came to Cambodia. Uh, during the uh, United Nations time, so to come to prepare for the election, and you know they spent more than two billion U.S. dollar in Cam uh, in Cambodia. Okay, and we still have a very high degree of dollarization, and this is you know this is take this take uh, some economists by surprise. They say why is that? Why higher dollarization when Cambodia is 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 more you know relatively peaceful, or, or we enjoy more peace, and then. Uh, we have higher dollarization, and probably some of you know in, uh, in international relations, mostly the country adopt a foreign currency because the country is not at peace. They are not sure about the future of the country. That's why they say, well, I don't take risk, uh, you know, <laughs> to sell in my domestic currency and save in US dollar. It's more secure when the country is not at peace. But in the case of Cambodia, you know, the more stable Cambodia is, the higher the degree of dollarization. Okay, somebody, people ask me, they say, why is that? <laughs> okay, right? Well, I have a car now, you know, there's no evidence from that, but what I feel is something, okay? <laughs> That's why we have that equity than some of the, uh, those people, okay? All right, so in terms of uh, investment, so who came to invest in Cambodia uh, before, so I, uh, you know, during my doctoral study, uh, my doctoral dissertation, I wrote on Cambodian investment as well, about the, why they come to invest in Cambodia, okay, what are the factors, and, uh, and also who are the, uh, the largest investor. So uh, from the opening up, from the, from the uh, uh, 1994 up to, uh, 2004, uh, Malaysia was the largest investor in Cambodia. Okay, so one of the one of the ASEAN member state is the largest investor in Cambodia. Right now, China. You see, I put Greater China include uh, mainland China, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. So that four, see that take almost half of uh, the foreign investment share in the country uh, from the opening up. I calculate the stock of investment from the opening up until recently in 2014. So I will have the data on 2015 uh, very soon from the, from the National Bank of, of Cambodia. And the United States, if you look at that, it's about, it's less than 3% in Cambodia, and mostly I think Cambodian American people uh, came to their own country uh, to invest there. And European country is another third, another largest international investor, so all combined is about, account for about 6.6% uh, only. So you see only China take almost everything, and, and then the number two is from ASEAN country, so from other member, uh, member state, mostly Singapore and that have a very high, large investment in the country. And as you know, for those who study international relations, 
And you know the largest, the three largest, what we uh, what called the three largest country in West in the world, and also international trade probably, is one is the United States, of course. Number two is European Union combined together, all European Union, and the third one is Japan. And if you look at if you look at that three country, European Union only about six six point six percent over. Uh, the period, you know, from the opening up until 2014, and United States uh, about 2.54, uh, almost 3 percent, and where is Japan? Yeah, Japan is about 3 percent. So Japan before was so small, almost nothing. So from from 1994 up to 2004, I calculate uh, Japanese investment in Cambodia, it was less than 1 percent. But now increase substantially, okay. Especially for the last the last few years, okay, it increased substantially. So we also uh, produce. I think one of Japanese uh, electronic company came to Cambodia and hire Cambodian people, train them, and then uh, they produce them, distribute to other other countries as well. Okay, so that's what happened uh, in those countries. And if you talk about the share, which one is the most uh, favorable one, the most uh, favorite one, that of course industry. Okay, you see industry take almost half of the half of the, the share. Okay, and and then followed by services. Uh, after that, agriculture. Agriculture a little bit higher before it was so small investment in agriculture. But right now the government want to you know want to promote uh, the production of you know uh, the produce. Okay, okay, the product uh, agriculture. <coughs> Activity. So some of the country uh, now express the interest to come to Cambodia, Cambodia to grow rice for export back to their own country because the land become become scarce right now. The land for agriculture in relative term. Okay, if you compute the industrial land, okay, divided by uh, or agricultural land divided by the total land in in the country, you will see United States probably <laughs> okay still not. Not a lot as well. Okay, right. So this is a this is the thing of what I call the um, the uh, the and the, uh, classification by industry. And uh, this is the the old data. I cannot find the new one because um, you know uh, that during my doctoral study I was successful in getting the data, all investment data. Then I classify into the uh, province. So in Cambodia, investment is so concentrated in Phnom Penh city. And why? Because I call the city of plenty. Okay, and countries in, in other provinces, sometimes in my native province, Takao province, is almost nothing. Here, that is, uh, that street from the bottom, Takao province, is just almost nothing, just one factory there. The whole province attracted only one factory, but Phnom Penh take almost all, about seven, seven, uh, seventy-seven percent of all the uh, all the investment just came to the city. Okay, because they can well electricity cheaper in in the city. They have water. They have running water. They have they have many things. But if you if you go to the countryside, you see a two different world. Okay, <laughs> two different world. And some of the province could not have enough uh, drinking water, so then it's difficult for them to invest there. So infrastructure is needed in order to distribute uh, investment into uh, other province. But now I see more investment coming to other provinces as well because of uh, the, you know the road rehabilitation. We build more road, uh, more access to electricity, uh, better uh, you know. A water system or thing, so then investment just moving out. That what I what I say. Well, if we want investment to go out of the city, then of course we have to develop infrastructure. That is uh, that is important for supporting the investment process. Okay, um, uh, you know because of the investment concentrated in the city, that's why you see the track load of worker from the countryside. To the city because some of them they could not afford to stay in the city if they are not so far away from the city they just take the track uh, to the city in the morning so in the morning they take the track and in the evening after work 
then they move back uh, to the village, okay? So they could earn more income by just uh, trying to locate investment close to them. And the land there is, is much cheaper, I think, in the countryside, okay? So what we need to build just road, electricity for them, you know, and then of course they will move uh, to the to the province, okay? Right, uh, so those who work in the track load, then uh, they are here in the in the garment sector, okay? So Cambodia have, uh, frankly speaking, we have a culture of working so hard. So when I work, even now I work so hard as well. <laughs> okay, so I work hard, I just enjoy working. We just enjoy working, okay? So we work so hard. So these worker, they start early in the morning. Uh, Sometimes they, they are supposed to, you know, uh, to take a rest, but they don't. They just want to, to earn extra money. So they, they work overtime. So they just work very hard, okay? So, and uh, I found that this, because of this kind of thing, that's why it brings the uh, poverty rate uh, you know, poverty rate of Cambodia dropped significantly. You will see in the in the other slides. Okay, so so because of education level as well, I think we improve uh, well to some. To me, we improve a lot in terms of education. Okay, so right now you go to Cambodia, you can you can find uh, schools. Okay, primary school, elementary school, high school. You can find primary school. You can find in almost every three village villages, okay? High school can be found in the commune as well, okay? In the commune. And here probably you call county or something. Or maybe county equivalent to the province, I'm not sure, but the commune uh, consists of around uh, more than 10 uh, villages. That's what we call the commune. And then in Cambodia we have village, we have commune, and then uh, we have province, okay? So that that the level. So villages, uh, commune, oh sorry, villages, commune, district, <laughs> I'm sorry. So district is higher level than commune, a number of commune become a district, a number of district than the province. So the province consists of uh, a number of district. So because of education, some of them uh, can go abroad. And those who do not have very high skill, not, not good enough skill, then they just travel to Thailand, and that is, that is the, uh, the immigration check uh, in the border between Cambodia and Thailand. So they just go to work in Thailand because the wage of relatives, uh, the wage of the same skill of worker in Thailand uh, is much higher than that in, in Cambodia. Okay, that's why uh, immigrant Cambodian uh, worker uh, wanted to, to take the jobs there so that they can get paid more paid, okay? And those who have higher skill can speak uh, Korean, can speak some Japanese, because those people came to Cambodia uh, to provide uh, English language training to Cambodian workers who want uh, to go to Korea, to work in Korea or in Japan, okay? So then, by the time that they acquire enough uh, English, uh, sorry, enough uh, domestic language, Japanese or Korean, then they are higher and then they can go uh, to Korea, they can go to Malaysia, they can go to Japan, but Korea is the, I think that the good place, that the place that uh, many Cambodian workers wanna go. They can earn more, I think they can earn around, well, around 1,000 to $2,000 per, per month working in Korea, mm -hmm. that they earn a lot. And not only earning in terms of their monthly uh, income, but they earn the skill that they could come back to Cambodia and then they can be entrepreneur by themselves, okay? I think a number of workers uh, have been very successful mm -hmm. and I, I noticed by myself as well, okay, <laughs> right. Um, Okay, this is the education thing. Uh, you see student, a lot of female students uh, took photograph with our prime minister. Now something has changed a lot between male education and female education. Historically, um, parents just wanted the male, you know, the, the son to go to school. And the daughter, 
just study for a number of years at school, and then they should have work in uh, in the house, okay, in the business, in the family business. So most of them uh, receive low education in the previous time, but now things have changed completely. Things have changed completely. Parents just want to give a equal opportunity to both uh, daughters and sons, okay? And on average <laughs> right now, the female student in almost all my classes, they are on top of the male student, <laughs> right? And this, this student, uh, uh, those who were uh, fresh high school graduate and they took national exam and most of the female students got an A. So they get more, you know, more female students got an A than the male counterpart right now. So you see there, so that's why I talk, I talk to uh, people, I say, well, female in physical strength, they are weaker, could be, but mental things, they're not, right? They're not. And the Cambodian government, I think this is because of Cambodian government policies as well. Uh, he promote, the Prime Minister promote, want to promote more women in managerial position in the government. So now we have deputy, female deputy prime minister. We have female minister and uh, secretary of state. I think secretary of state here is different. Secretary of state equal to uh, minister, but in Cambodia we have minister, secretary, secretary, secretary of state, and the secretary of, of state. Okay, so that's what, what we have in, in those countries. And you see a lot of female right now. In, in one of the class that I taught in other university in Cambodia, in one class of about uh, 35 students, only four only four male students in my class, and the rest are female. <laughs> I said, well, a lot of things have changed. This is what I call social change, okay? A lot of things have changed as well, so, okay. And you see there, mostly in Cambodia, if you are the best, you are standing in the front, okay? The best one, they are raised that. The best have to be. <laughs> and though, with the Prime Minister, I assume to be the top one. Okay, the one who is close to, uh, the prime minister so <laughs> okay right so this i talk um, uh, i just mentioned earlier so because we receive investment uh, from abroad create jobs for uh, create a lot of jobs uh, for low skill young low cost low skill cambodian worker so those who used to work in the rice field they earn little thing and mostly in Cambodia, we have only two seasons, not like here. So we have only rainy season, that is during farming, uh, farming season, and the dry season. So mostly we are forced to be unemployed in the dry season. We didn't have something uh, uh, to work, you know? But when we have the factory, we can work, you know, for the full year. So uh, after Pol Pot regime, I think 100% of Cambodians were extremely poor. Not just poor, but I think it just, very, very poor, extreme poverty. We were in extreme poverty. We were hunger. I filled my stomach with just a kind of the leaf of the tree. I got a little salt, didn't have enough rice to eat. I was so hungry. And then I, I, had, to, I had to take care of the cows, my cows, <laughs> my ox. And then with little salt, I ate, I used the, uh, the leaf of the tree, which can be eaten. Okay, and with the solid, eat that to fill my stomach. Okay, and just drink water <laughs> to fill my stomach, not to, not to be hungry during that time, I remember. Okay, right. So we had the data from uh, 2004, the estimate were, that the estimate won by the Cambodian government, you see the line is different, okay? That one is by the Cambodian government. So, okay. So that, this is by the World Bank, and that is by the Cambodian government. Uh, then you see the estimate is very similar, but the statistic a little bit different, but here for the last two years, it's very almost exactly the same, okay? So on average, we see the poverty drop significantly from 100% very extreme poverty after the fall of Pol Pot regime to about 60% or maybe about, well, about 53 to 63% in 2004, okay? And then it dropped significantly to about 20% in 2011. I think now it's even much, 
even much lower, okay? Because the trade, I think the effect from trade is so significant in this case. Because the trade, uh, mostly we trade in labor intensive uh, product, which is shoe and garment. And you know, the producer shoe and garment, they don't need a PhD to do it, okay? Just, they just, just a little education, know how to, uh, to do the work good, then they can get a job, all right? So that's why you see this uh, kind of uh, uh, success of the uh, poverty reduction uh, for Cambodia. Okay, um, uh, this is from my research. I don't, I'm not, a, I, well, I don't uh, want to show you all the economic model, all the equation or mathematics. I just want to show you the evidence that I received from the estimation, okay? We economists, we build, we build mathematical model okay <laughs> in order to estimate something okay so but i i just show you this uh so for the period uh from you know from the uh, uh from 1994 up to now so i estimate that i find that uh, when foreign country when investor country become richer uh that is the the uh, that is the uh, important thing for <coughs> Cambodian investment. Meaning that when they become richer, they want to look for investment opportunity in other country. Okay, I think one of the thing maybe they want to diversify uh, their income, their their uh, business as well, right? <laughs> okay, so they they look for the investment in other country, and then they have to make comparison. Okay, in terms of labor, in terms of politics in, in terms of security, in terms of many things, and finally they end up in Cambodia, okay? Right, um, then um, when, when uh, FBI country become richer, then there is more, more probability that they come to invest in Cambodia. That is one of the things. Another thing is, is trade relation, okay? As I said, they just bring in something, they produce final product in Cambodia, they re-export back to their country, or they just export to third uh, market, okay, to other countries such as United States or European Union, okay, under uh, GSP, what we call GSP, General System of Preferences, okay. Or uh, in Europe, they call uh, everything but arms, okay. You can export to to Europe under least developing status, de developed status country, um, almost everything except ammunition and arms, okay, which is not allowed for European Union, okay, right. Uh, also, we sign a number of investment uh, agreement in order to give guarantee that your investment in Cambodia is safe, you are not nationalized, okay. So that also play an important role for attracting investment from other countries uh, to uh, the Kingdom of Cambodia as well, right. Um, uh, of course, political risk, you know, is negatively affecting uh, 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 the investment into a particular country. So, which means that the higher political risk, the lower the level of investment, and no one want to take risk of going to the country with high risk. Okay, if uh, if if the return is comparable to investing in other countries as well. Right, um, resource seeking investment is one of the one of the motive uh, for the investment into Cambodia as well. Okay, some of the investment uh, because uh, the country we still have untaped uh, resources, natural resources, and then they come to take advantage of that. We don't we don't have the ability to take it by ourselves. Okay, that we need the investment uh, to come and to exploit it. Okay, and recently I worked on the institution. I think for those who are in uh, in international relation in. In, uh, in politics, in political science. So actually I try, right now I try to link uh, between uh, political science to see the relationship between uh, international relations, political science with economic activity. Of course politics, uh, you know, affects economic a lot and vice versa, right? <laughs> okay, right. So I, I estimate uh, whether uh, institutions play any role in uh, promoting investment income in Cambodia, one of my paper, so it is. It's matter for the investment into Cambodia, okay? And the paper already now sent to the academic journal for a possible uh, publication. Okay. Um, 
Okay, um, you know, when investment coming to your country, you work in the investment, uh, uh, foreign invest, uh, invested uh, foreign project, then not only worker can get the salary, but they also can get the skill, which is not available in, in the host country. Okay, so I try to estimate that in my doctoral dissertation, I try to estimate whether a Cambodian worker can have a kind of technology transfer from a foreign company. And we find the evidence uh, that we receive some uh, knowledge transfer. So technology spill over on Cambodian worker, okay? Through interaction, through uh, mobility of worker between foreign company and Cambodian company. So we learned that. And, and, and this is uh, the thing in in my doctoral dissertation as well. Um, another one is about international trade. So uh, people just say, well, uh, probably a foreign investment can play an important role in improving Cambodian trade position. So I estimate that this is not really the case. You know why? Even though we export a lot under uh, when the investment, uh, foreign investment come into the country, it leads also higher export of um, <coughs> Cambodia to the rest of the world, but we import a lot as well, okay? So we see that, I try to estimate that, and then there's no evidence that we uh, improve our trade uh, uh, position, like in the United States, Cambodia, in terms of international trade position. Cambodia and the United States have chronic trade deficit, okay? And some people say, well, this may not be really good. I say it depends. Sometimes you import more, it doesn't, when you have uh, trade deficit, it does, it's not necessarily that uh, it is bad because it depends on the composition of your import. If you import a kind of capital good, more capital good than consumption good, then could lead to more economic growth and could uh, create jobs, you know, it promote development for those countries, okay? So that depends on the composition of uh, their, uh, their trade as well. So I found, I found um, as I said, uh, uh, FDI investment, foreign direct investment, uh, does not have, uh, uh, does not play an important role in improving international trade position in Cambodia, okay? Because they import the same as they export, so there's no improvement, okay? And this play an important role, general system of preferences, as I said, because this is a kind of uh, uh, preferential tra treatment given to poor countries such as Cambodia by developed countries such as the United States, European Union, Canada, Japan, for example, okay? And I think given this, giving this kind of access could play a much more important role, especially uh, for the, you know, relatively skilled people in the host country, okay? Right, if you give money, sometimes money can be not so uh, well managed, but if you give trade access, most of the company, when they go to, to produce in poor country, they produce mostly using labor intensive, okay? Then they hire more low skilled worker to work, and then that's how they can get out of the poverty, I think, okay? Right. Um, Okay, so you see the tiger. Why I put the tiger? <laughs> so why I put the tiger? This is the current uh, things of Cambodia. So a very good news is, uh, is that last year, the World Bank just upgraded uh, Cambodian status from low-income country to lower middle-income country, okay? Because we achieved more than 1,000 uh, dollar per capita, per person, per year. Then we, we move up to another ladder, uh, another status of the, uh, in the World Bank. As in the Bank, the two work, and then the result, the, the two work independently, but they get consistent result. So as in the Bank predict that Cambodia would become a new uh, Asia, Asian tiger economy, 
in the future because we could maintain high growth rate of around 7% over the longest period you know, in a recorded history. So I look at the data, and not only me who found that, but also people at Asian Environment Bank, other economists also found very similar as well. So we enjoy high growth over a long period of time. You know, and if the government Cam of Cambodia could successfully diversify its economy from the four driver to more driver, then we are not going to be so affected by any external shock, and then we could also, you know, promote more growth uh, for the country. Okay, and that, of course, education plays an important role, mm. and that's why I'm, I'm very glad that many Cambodian people, many Cambodian, uh, Cambodian students, you know, they are so committed to go to school. They work during the daytime, in the evening, because I also work in the daytime. I try to devote my time during the evening to teach at university. And not only at one university, I don't have a mention. So I, I in Cambodia, I, I, I was teaching at different universities. And why I want to do so? Because I want to give access to students who may not be able to come to an expensive university. So I even go to the province as well. I don't make any income from doing that. So just to pay for gasoline and food, and that's all for the salary that I can earn from go into the province to teach at university in the province because I want students to get access to a thing that, that is in the city as well, okay? So this is, uh, this is uh, the thing that is hopeful for, for Cambodia, okay? We are moving. And the last one, uh, this is Phnom Penh City. Phnom Penh City, okay. That Phnom Penh City. So you see that uh, because of uh, this kind of uh, successful uh, development and that what we have, okay? But the bottom line is that successful development uh, will not be realized if the country is not at peace, stability, both political and economic, okay? Right. So thank you very much for your attention and this is uh, uh, my <laughs>